longer in the Zoom, but I'm very not tech. Nope. It's okay. I got I got it, Sue. Okay. You should start, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And then I'll keep looking for admits. Um, probably everybody knows I'm Sue Morosky, Prescott Audubon president. And thank you for coming to our Zoom meeting. I'm glad we got started pretty uneventfully. Um, one announcement is we are going to have the Christmas bird count this year and Michelle Runquist is still in charge of it. She's going to be getting together an email for me and I'm gonna be sending it out to everybody by MailChimp probably next week. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're interested, look out for that. Also, just to let everybody know, I'm recording the meeting and let me enter somebody or admit somebody here, whoops. Okay, they're admitted. And also too, this has nothing to do with Audubon, but it has to do with Zoom. Do you know that Audubon does not, or Zoom rather, does not tell you when they have updates? You have to go to your Zoom account and uh, look for, check for updates and then click on that. Um, I've been doing that once a week and they seem to have updates all the time. Oh, I like that smiley face for Shannon. <laughs> That's really good. <laughs> Here we go. I'm just trying to get it just right. Sorry to be distracting. That's okay. It's and better then, than my double chin with me laying in bed. There we go. I'm gonna get all, all cozy for your talk. <laughs> Look nice and relaxed. Okay. And then I'll, uh, if we would do want people not to talk during the meeting, but there'll be lots of chance to ask questions afterwards. And so I'll turn the program over to Mary, and she's going to introduce tonight's speaker. Hi, everybody. Mary Birdsong. I'm the program chair for Prescott Audubon. Um, I, and I, if you have a question, you can also put it in chat as well. So if you're, the, you're like me and you don't remember the question that you wanted to ask, and ask by the end of the uh, presentation, it, it's there. Um, I'd like to present um, Jen Salem, who is the Regional Science Consortium's Horticultural Specialist. And in that capacity, she manages the plant lab and the greenhouse. Um, she is a Penn State Master Gardener and the founder and program director of Go Native Erie, an initiative that promotes the use of native plants in home, school, and community gardens. Um, tonight, of course, she's going to be talking about the wetland restoration at Presque Isle, um, a topic that mm -hmm. I think is um, interesting to a lot of us because we care about the, the health of our wetlands and the birds and other animals that live there. So I give you Jen. Well, thank you. Um, well, first, I'd like to say um, I, I, I wanted to give a thank you to uh, Prescott Audubon for um, asking me to speak because um, I actually really enjoy talking to people about the work that I do. And this has been such an odd year. I haven't really um, done a lot of presentations. So, um, and I, I think that although, you know, my background is in plants, um, I'll try to um, include some bird information. Um, just full disclosure, I do not, I'm not a birder. Um, and um, it's okay, Jen. You don't really even have to mention the birds if you don't want to. Well, I do see birds. So remember that I spend um, a majority of my job is spent in the wetlands. So um, I can recognize common wetland type birds and um, other birds that are around um, in some of the areas that I do work in. But um, it's kind of funny because you do get accustomed to seeing uh, things like bald eagles, for example, in the wetland areas. And um, just real funny story before I get started, um, I had, uh, I was doing work in Thompson Circle and cars kept slowing down and I'm like, oh no. People are watching me work. I don't, I don't, you know, want this. And I realized that they weren't watching me work. They were looking at a bald eagle that was sitting in a tree on the other side of the wetland I was working in. So um, it's kind of funny that um, people have their focuses. Like I'm all about plants and sometimes oblivious to the other things around me. Um, but uh, yeah, they're there and they, uh, they scare the heck out of me because usually when I encounter a bird in the wetland, it um, must have gotten too close to its nest and it's flying out at me. So um, it's, <laughs> it's a little scary. Or it's a red-winged blackbird that's pecking me. 
So um, that's, I'm not a fan there, but I'm going to share my screen and we're going to go through and talk about the restoration. Um, I'm not sure, you know, I know some of you on the um, Zoom do, you're familiar with it. Um, if you don't know about it, this will this will be a good overview for you. And then, um, you know, I love to answer questions. So please, you know, if you have something, um, please save it um, or put it in the chat box. So I guess um, sit back, relax. If you have a glass of wine or something, that's cool too. And uh, we'll just go through this and talk about wetland restoration. Okay, let's see here if I can share this. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> see the chat. Let's see here. Okay, here is share screen. And um, you're you're gonna Sue. Would you mind um, enabling the screen sh participant screen sharing so oh, I can? Uh, okay, hold on. Let me do this. Oh, okay. um. How about if I make you a co-host? I think that'll let you share because that looks like the quickest way to do this. Okay. 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 Sure. Uh, yeah. Okay. Try now. See what happens. Yes. Okay. All righty. So sure. <laughs> All right. So, um, ooh, we're going a little too fast here. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay. So I have a very touchy computer, so I'll try not to move this. So um, this uh, wetland restoration project has actually been going on on the park for almost 10 years now. Um, I was brought in on phase two of the project. And um, what that is, is that um, the, the first phase was a three-year um, assessment survey and um, some invasive species removal. Um, the second and third phase, and we're in the third phase of this right now, um, it, was, um, it was incorporating uh, plant propagation, and that's what my specialty is. So um, right now, um, we're looking at working until 2021 on this project, and we're hoping to continue funding with that. So, um, you know, it's, it's, um, it's a, an amazing job. It's a great opportunity but it also is something that is a, a federally funded uh, project. So um, anyone that's worked on grants before knows that, um, you know, your time can be limited um, depending on where, you know, funding sources are. So um, we're gonna move ahead. And um, I'm assuming that most everyone is pretty fam familiar with Presque Isle. Um, what you might not realize is that um, when the park goes in and removes plants, um, oftentimes, it takes years and years and years for um, native plants to fill back in. And um, unfortunately that creates an environment where um, invasive plants can, that have been removed um, actually can um, come right back in. And we decided that we would like to try to grow plants um, and, and kind of fill in these bare areas to see if that would encourage more natives to take over um, and we'd have like less issues with invasive species coming in. And, and just so you know, an invasive species, um, probably you're familiar with bird invasives. Um, so it's just something that's not from the area that causes some kind of disruption um, in the ecosystem that we're working in. And so plants are the same thing. Um, so they take over really quickly and um, they actually, they really destroy natural areas and we're trying to keep Presque Isle as natural as we can. So, um, so we selected some sites on the park and uh, right now we have three uh, wetland sites and I'll, I'll show you where those are. Um, so if they look um, if you see pink flags or like fencing or something like that in the three sites, you'll know that we're out there working. It doesn't always look pretty, um, but I'll talk about that a little bit later too. So um, Thompson Circle, and that is, um, it's adjacent to Thompson's Bay and it's right along the roadway, uh, kind of between Beach 10 and 11. So let's see here. And this is the, this is the Google Earth view of it. Um, and to orient yourself, um, Thompson's Bay is on your, what's your right, 
right side of the screen um, or in backwards. So, <laughs> um, and then Leo's landing and Leo's is, before you get to um, the ranger station, it's uh, the area that has the little boardwalk um, that is uh, the feather, that observation deck. And Leo's is a really uh, beautiful area that was really, that was a monoculture of cattail, I think, uh, an early cattail at one time. Um, and here it is on Google Earth. And if you look just to the left of the box, you can see that that's where the observation deck is. Um, you can pull over and uh, take a walk and look over the wetland. It's a, it's a really great place for pictures and probably a good place for birding too. Um, I always see a lot of um, marsh wrens, and I think it might be the least bittern that's in there. I don't know if if you know that I'm wrong, you can say that. Um, it's something that has like longer legs that flies out, has a longer beak. I don't think it's a heron. Okay. Um, I have seen least bittern there. Okay, good. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the bitterns were in there the last few years this past summer the high water really uh, knocked them out of there but uh, okay. they had nested in there um, I'm pretty sure uh, a couple of years ago oh cool okay yeah um, and I'll talk about Lee Spinner too uh, that actually changed our whole uh, resource management plan um, so yeah one one bird uh, kind of changed how we how we had to do the restoration but that's actually a good thing that's a good thing um, so uh, this is the peninsula neck or the head of the peninsula and this is on, when you drive into the peninsula, it's on your um, right side, it's on the bay, and it's the area that has a lot of dead trees or dying trees. And um, just so you know, there's a, there's a reason for that. Those were an invasive tree called the European black alder. And so a few years ago, the park decided that they should be killed. Um, so I'm trying to look to see if there's any, our interns that are our invasive team uh, do a method where they cut some of the bark off and spray a chemical in the trees. Um, and so that, that was pretty effective. The, the problem that I have there is that there was pretty much no understory. So we have a lot of flooding in that area. So if you walk the multi-purpose trail, that's often, um, it, it's just the, the topography of that area, plus the fact that there aren't a lot of plants um, there that are really taking up a lot of um, water right now, or, and there's not a lot of root systems that are holding that like silt in, um, that's starting to become an issue. So if you see fencing in that area, that's me kind of playing around with things in there. So, and here's the, the area that we work in it's before you get to Vista One. And if you look on the top corner of the map, you'll see a beach with um, actually break walls. So that kind of gives you an idea of where we're looking at here. Okay. So um, I did want to explain some, some of our methods and how we're unique. Um, the first thing is that on any state park, we are the only restoration um, that grows plants on site. Um, and we have an on the park for the park philosophy. And what that means is that we don't go to greenhouses and nurseries and buy their product in and bring it down and plant on the park. Um, what my job is, is to um, propagate the things either sexually or asexually. And so by seed or by taking like vegetative or hardwood cuttings um, and then um, growing those plants um, right back. And it's basically taking the plants that we have on the park, um, using their seed or parts of them and then putting them right back on the park. So every year I do um, some shoreline surveys and we keep track of what species are in each of the restoration areas. And then I will collect seed um, or take cuttings of things so that they can be put right back into that same area. So um, the reason that we chose to do that is because um, many times plants that are grown commercially are grown in Michigan or Florida or um, a, a lot of our plants actually that are sold as perennials come 
from southern states, but we wanted to make sure that we had um, things that were cold hardy for us and then also um, things that were like the Presque genotype. So we're kind of being purists with this, but we had the ability to do it and we have the facilities to do it. So we decided to see um, if it was something that, that could be worked into our program. Um, and right now it's working out really, really well. Um, I just finished the seed collection part of my project and I'm actually um, gonna be starting my hardwood cuttings probably in another month or so. Um, and that um, takes at least three months to do. So that'll keep me busy in the winter. I know a lot of people ask if I still work in the winter, but I, my job is year round. Um, and actually I'm, I'm pretty busy um, either seeding my trays or um, doing the hardwood cuttings for the winter. So, but I'll show you some pictures too. So, um, so what we did as far as species selection, I kind of indicated that we look at things that are in each site to try to determine what is gonna go back in. Um, one thing that we wanted to focus on particularly were pollinators. Um, and so we did choose pollinator plants when appropriate. Um, so I'll just go through these really quick. Um, so number one is obedient plant. And that's a common wetland plant, but if you look in the background, you say that looks like a parking lot. That's the Tom Ridge Center uh, parking lot. So that's a really versatile plant that can go in wet or dry or locations. Um, it does spread, so <laughs> be forewarned. Um, then uh, number two is button bush. Um, I know any of the birders that are going in wet areas have seen this before. There's a ton of button bush on the park. Um, number three is the northern blue flag iris, which um, is in all three of our wetland sites. There's an invasive um, on our park that is yellow, um, a yellow flag iris. So uh, we want the purple ones, we don't want the yellow ones. <laughs> so um, the little pink um, kind of spikelet, number four, uh, that's a steeple bush. And um, that's just found in Thompson Circle. Um, there's very low populations of that on the park. Um, then we have, does anyone know what number five is? That's one of my favorite. <laughs> 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 so that's, a, that's a red osier, red twig dogwood. Um, that I read somewhere that that promotes, I think the um, at least 60 uh, pollinators uh, whether it's in like larval stage or adult stage. Um, so that's a real beneficial one. That's actually a really easy shrub to propagate if we have anybody that likes to tinker around with plants. That's a, that's a super easy one to make more of. Um, and I have tons of it if anybody would like some. <laughs> and it's, be it's beautiful when it drops its leaves, those red stems are just stunning in the winter. They really are. Um, and then uh, number six, there's a a swamp milkweed with a European honeybee on, on that. Um, and then number seven is a tiny little uh, flower called mar marsh skull cap that um, I've been noticing more and more of. So I think that that's starting to, to make a good comeback uh, here. And that would be uh, beneficial to like really, really tiny pollinators because the flower is pretty small. So, um, and also I guess again, um, some of these are kind of odd species, especially with like the rushes and sedges. And so you wouldn't necessarily be able to buy those commercially anyway. So, um, so that's one, uh, another reason, I guess, why we decided to um, do it ourselves. <laughs> so, um, and then, uh, like I said, we grow everything on site. Um, we have, I'll, I'm going to call it three facilities, but it's really two different buildings. Um, we have the um, consortium's plant lab. We have the Regional Science Consortium greenhouse that's at the Tom Ridge Center. And then we also have a cold frame greenhouse down on uh, Presque Isle. And I'll show you pictures of all those. Um, this is what uh, the lab looks like when we're doing seed collections. Um, I bring things in, we photograph, um, I identify it, and then we work with a professor from California University of Pennsylvania and he also makes like a second ID on some of the things um, just to make sure that we have two sets of eyes on it. Um, you know, some of the carexes and sedges can be, or carexes and rushes can be really, really similar. 
So um, we document what we find and then everything here um, gets uh, processed and then put in a walk-in cooler for stratification. And, and that's just like simulating winter um, for these seeds because they have to go into the cooler for anywhere between like 30 and 120 days typically. Um, so, and this is a, a working lab. So it is usually very, very messy um, like it is right now. So, and then this is the greenhouse. Um, this is what it looks like in, in March when I start bringing all the trays out. Um, and if you look um, outside, you can see it's rainy. Inside, I have really high humidity because my glass is all fogged up there. Um, we actually are really fortunate because we were able to get two donations, um, one from the Penn State Extension Master Gardeners in Erie County and one from Carrie T. Watson Garden Club this year. And we're gonna be doing some renovations to the greenhouse um, and update some of the equipment, adding an irrigation system in there and some lights. Um, and so I'm really excited because I think that we're gonna be able to produce um, better quality things and like a higher quantity of things. Um, and I'll, I'll talk numbers as far as like how much um, we're seeding and stuff and how many cuttings we take um, kind of later in here. And then let's look at, here's the, um, the consortium's growing site on the park. Um, this is actually op an open area. And so anyone can come down and check it out. Um, it is pretty tidy right now. Um, that's not always the case, but it is off of the maintenance road on the park. And that would be kind of going closer to, if you follow the signs for the lighthouse, um, you can kind of probably see it from the road across from the sawmill beaches now. So it's up there. Um, we have a, a storage shed and uh, what you don't see in this picture is um, some deer fencing um, because we do have a lot of deer that come up here and browse our things. But for restoration purposes, the plants don't have to look great. They just have to be able to be viable when we put them in the ground. So. Um, we have a lot of uh, groundhogs, turkey, um, you name it, um, that's up here most of the time. So we kind of let them come in and out as they please, but um, it's, as anyone's tried to keep animals out of their garden, you know, it's really impossible. So, um, and then um, our, our installs, uh, when we plant things, um, they're actually mostly volunteers that help me do that. So. This year has been a real challenge because we were really weren't able to take volunteers for most of the year. Uh, I actually only had one come in and that was in October, um, end of October. Um, and the fact that we use volunteers actually determined where our first restoration sites would be because we had to be able to get um, you know shovels and other equipment, we had to get plants, and we had to get people back to areas on the park that might not be very easily accessible. So um, you know it, it was a, a challenge to find areas that kind of fit the bill. Um, now that we've had some experience working on this, I think we may work in a little bit more remote locations. Um, and it's just going to be a little bit slower going as far as like um, how we get our volunteers back. We used to just, we literally had buses drive up with students that would come in. Um, and I, I don't think that's going to be the case for a while. So, um, and here's what my, my last group from Carrie T, they planted down at Leo's Landing. Um, this is a little center median thing that I've been fighting with for two years now. Um, it, it's uh, this area floods really badly. So this is actually underwater quite a bit. Um, and I just, that whole tip of Leo's landing is just, um, it's been a challenge because it keeps, it, it wants, I think, to be underwater a lot. Um, I know we have really high water levels right now, but I'm also like looking at, you know, erosion and are we going to be able to keep the trees at the end of the, you know, because after a while trees just start failing, they get stressed um, if they're under a lot of water when they don't, you know, can't tolerate it. So um, I'm kind of looking at the health of a plant community in these areas. And um, it's just, it's a real challenge. And I, I know we haven't really talked about um, high water levels that much, but I think I do mention it like further in the 
the um, presentation and there have been some really serious challenges to that. And I know any of you that have gone to Presque Isle to um, you know, do any kind of bird observations. Um, if you try to hike the trails, they're underwater. If you try to go to areas that used to be pretty dry, they might be underwater right now. Um, and, and so that's not only a challenge for visitors, but it's also um, definitely a challenge for us when we're working there. I'm trying to look at the safety of all of our volunteers, um, but also the feasibility of, you know, are these things going to be here when we plant them, I mean, they could they could wash away if we have you know a storm surge or some kind of high water event. So um, that's where you're seeing like some fencing and things like that um, because we're just we're trying to keep the plants in where we plant them. So and then monitoring, which I kind of already mentioned. Um, so we do go out. This, these are two of my colleagues from the consortium. Um, we're in the lagoon system, and, and we were actually scouting for some invasive species that day. Um, and just a real quick sidebar on this, um, someone had dumped a fish tank into the lagoon system with two invasive plant species in, in the tank um, that were actually found growing um, probably a month or so after they dumped it. Um, and that actually that is a project we worked on for about three months to mitigate. Um, and that was Pennsylvania DCNR, the Regional Science Consortium, uh, DEP, uh, Western Pennsylvania Conservancy, like a lot of groups had to get together and um, try to figure out what to do with, with what was dumped. Um, we actually had a water hyacinth and water lettuce, um, which are two common aquarium, like pond plants. Um, they're a southern species of plant, so we can kind of breathe a sigh of relief because our winters more than likely will kill them. Um, but there have been studies where they've been found um, in, I believe, Iowa and maybe Michigan. Um, and so, and th they, those areas do have um, pretty cold winters. So um, we had to actually go out multiple times to try to do all the collections to remove it. Um, so that's something that I, you know, I'm not sure if people release birds on the park very often, um, but that's one thing, you know, all, all plants are not created equal. So um, since I have your ear right now, that's just my <laughs> 30 second public service announcement about dumping things on the park because that actually, um, that was a lot of man hours to go through. And that's something that we're going to need to monitor next year to see if anything comes back up. So it's kind of scary when you're at like the beginning of, you know, a potential outbreak for invasives. Just, um, you know, I don't know. That was just, uh, I don't know <laughs> what to say about that. Because um, obviously we monitor because we don't want areas to look like this. And um, if you're familiar with Phragmites, that's uh, this is a researcher that's standing in front of it. Um, this is what a lot of our restoration sites looked like prior to treatment. So um, I'm not sure how how birds feel about Phragmites, but um, I know as far as like uh, the native plants just cannot outcompete, uh, you know, this stuff. So um, this is kind of a, a good picture because. I challenge people to go back now and after almost 10 years and find a stand that looks this big. Um, the interns have really done a really great job with uh, Pennsylvania DCNR. Um, we've also used helicopters and just a lot of boots on the ground trying to monitor uh, some of the that risk sites. So hopefully the, the birds are coming back. Um, but uh, okay. COVID-19 updates. Um, this year, I'm sure it's been weird for everyone, um, but we weren't able to work, um, like for, for us in the consortium, we weren't able to work at the Tom Ridge Center um, starting, in, I think it was March 16th, we were uh, told we had to leave, um, pack up things for two weeks, and then, you know, work from home. And a few months later, we were able to come back. So um, the problem with this is that a week prior to, I had put all my um, seedlings in the greenhouse and some of my things were germinating. 
And so I had to come up with a solution, um, kind of, uh, to that. So I apologize, but this is the inside of my garage. And um, I had to build a makeshift greenhouse in there. Um, it was completely thrown together and unexpected. Um, and I'll tell you what, uh, the results were poor, um, but it, it, I guess I, I had to try because I wasn't willing to let everything go for the year. Um, if you look at the first picture, you'll see like just a couple sets of lights hanging up kind of high. Um, we were trying to move heat mats on the floor. I had heaters, I had fans, I had lights over all the trays. Um, and uh, it was just, it was a mess. So I, I had, um, I had, we'll call it limited success. Um, these are my, what my trays look like. You can see the lights have been brought down closer um, once I put the trays under there. Um, this is what I did at home for three months. Um, and we actually, we, we had decent germination, but the seedlings were weak and leggy and poor and um, not nice quality and, and died off after a while and all kinds of great stuff. So, um, so I kind of talked about that. Uh, I actually, to try to help the trays of plants, um, I would rotate them uh, every other day just to see if that would help, I, I don't know, um, kind of increase their vigor and it, it just didn't really do a whole lot. So, um, uh, luckily in June, I was given the okay to come back and bring all the living plants uh, back with me. And um, so that worked out just fine. It was, it was fine. It was a, a good learning experience for me because, you know, if you don't try, you don't know. So, um, and, and so I, I know now that my garage does not make sense to grow in. So, um, and then uh, I mentioned high water levels. These are some pictures from Leo's and I think the head of the peninsula. Um, this was just a, a really difficult workaround because you know who who can get it. You can't you can't plant if there's not really a lot of land. Um, so we had um, you know very few volunteers or no volunteers for a long time. Um, I did have plants wash away, and um, my picture here is of a whole bunch of plants that have rooted together. Um, because they were in the pot too long. Um, I, I had to postpone almost all my planting until the fall. And by then, some of these smaller plants just were ready. They were just ready to get put in the ground. So um, I did come up with these hideous ways of fencing and corralling plants in. You'll see more of these black silt fences um, in other locations, unfortunately. Um, but that's basically because the water was rising and falling so quickly that we go plant and then a few hours later things were already starting to wash away because the water has had rid risen. So this actually this fence has been here for two years um, and is holding its own the silt fencing um, at the head of the park is kind of damaged right now but the plants rooted in and that was what we were looking for. Uh, to have happen. So they stayed in place. Um, park management doesn't like uh, either method. So um, I did come up with a third way to try to keep plants in and, and that was by staking. And it's just um, basically skewering them with bamboo stakes. And that seemed to work relatively well. Um, this is Thompson Circle, and so if you see a bunch of bamboo sticks sticking out of the ground, that's that's me. Um, and they're basically um, what's happening in the in the picture that looks like a bunch of sticks and mud. Um, the bamboo skewers in the middle, and then some hardwood cuttings are around the outside of that. And you can see that there's sediment that's kind of. Um, gathering up along the side. And so I'm hoping that those plants will root in and then be able to anchor themselves in that area. So regardless of what the water level's like, they're gonna be stuck there. So um, this is some just sh action shots of us doing restoration work and field work. 
um, basically a lot of plant surveys and trying to identify what's out there. Um, we do have a lot of help from California University of uh, Pennsylvania and the, the guy in the red shirt, uh, Dr. Uh, Bob White, is um, a colleague that I, I usually am out working with um, to do the surveys. So he's a, a guy and, and we like fighting about plants. So that's always nice to have somebody that you can argue with. <laughs> so uh, you know it's serious when we're both breaking out the field guides. Um, so, and then uh, this is basically what a wetland planting looks like. Um, everything comes on a truck. Um, from that greenhouse by our maintenance building. Um, it, we find an area that's kind of empty uh, and then we just sort of lay it out in a scattered way because you know nature doesn't usually do straight lines. Um, and we just add things in the quantity that we think is enough to fill in an area. And uh, this actually I think is all from Thompson's Circle right by the multi-purpose trail. So hopefully those guys are still in there. Um, I do go back and monitor every so often, but um, I also am now co-directing the Weed Warrior program. Um, and so we, again, have not been able to take volunteers. Uh, what this group does is actually go out and monitor for invasive species and then manually remove them. So they focus on Oriental Bittersweet. And in the spring, they do a removal of a garlic mustard. Um, and actually, I did not, I don't have a close up of garlic mustard in there. The pretty pink flower at the bottom is a flowering rush, which is an invasive species. And then the thing on my lab table that says like PI lagoons, um, that's the water lettuce that um, we were taking out of the lagoon system. So, um, and then the, the guy in the center picture, that's my co-director, Tom Cermak from Pennsylvania Sea Grant. And that red thing he's carrying, um, it's actually like a poison dart gun. It has like a bullet full of poison in it and we can kill the Oriental Bittersweet. Um, we can just like hit it with the, um, the little dart gun and it will um, inject a, an herbicide into the like woody vine that, it, um, that the Bittersweet uh, creates. So that's kind of a new toy for him, I think. So, and I, I did put a little blurb on here about weed warriors. Um, because next year we are taking volunteers, I think. It might not be in the spring, but um, we would like people to come in and we'll have some work days. Um, I, I do the like, group volunteer coordination on that. And then Tom would be like the weekly, like if they do a, um, a weekly get together kind of thing. So um, if, you know, Audubon would want to come in. <laughs> sometime, um, you know, we could do like a plant chat and like maybe a removal or something in an area. If, if you wanted to choose it too, if there's a, a birding site that you think is starting kind of overcrowded with invasives, that would be great to come in as a group and kind of learn about the plants that are there and then, you know, tackle an area. Um, I don't know if like fry, fries is a good place or I know there's a lot of weird stuff down there. So but yeah, <laughs> you're, um, Mary, you're my off. I know, oh. I, I just turned it on. That's um, okay. um, the um, uh, Audubon has been very active in Weed Warriors. Cool, okay. I kind of thought that I remember um, like back Pri in the- Prior day. to this year, yeah. 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 Um, we, we had a team and, um, Actually, we started it. <laughs> that does not surprise me. <laughs> and you know, we, you know, we ended up getting it because unfortunately Environment Erie dissolved at the end of last year. And so Absolutely. They well, it, it, it kind of grew beyond our capacity yeah. and, and was taken over by an agency that, you know, could, could handle it and had mm -hmm. staff and whatever. But we actually started it um, probably about 10 years ago. Oh, okay. um, and um, we started working on fries. That was our first location. Okay. And Niagara, the Niagara boat launch area where we used to band there, people used to band there. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. 
But yeah, I I, uh, I knew that you did uh, a lot of work at Fry's. So I thought, and I, I've kind of checked that area out a little bit too, um, just seeing if there's anything, you know, what's going on down there, uh, plant-wise, of course. Um, so yeah, that would that's wonderful. And um, yeah, we're, we're looking forward to like hitting the ground running on this. I'm glad I mentioned it um, because, you know, we kind of, it was sort of by default that we're taking this over, but um, it does seem to fit really well with like what I do on the parks and some already out in areas sort of scouting for potential restoration sites. And then, um, you know, looking at, at, like I said, the plant community and monitoring different areas. Um, that was a natural fit for me. And then Tom, um, he does the, um, the, through the Western Pennsylvania Conservancy, he does their like weed management program. Um, and so that it, it again, like partnering us uh, together, I think is a good fit. Um, I just, I was really disappointed. We couldn't have any events or do, I mean, we were ready to kick everything off and then, you know, had to kind of miss the whole, the whole season. So, um, but yeah, that's, I'm looking forward to doing things next year. I think that's going to be a, a fun, um, you know, group, because we're going to try to incorporate some education with it too. It won't just be like going and, you know, ripping out plants. So we'll try to do some cool stuff. So, and then, um, oh boy, I always talk a really long time. About, I'm sorry. <laughs> so I know we started a little late, but I'm running over. Um, so, the, uh, so just like uh, what I would say is like, we've had some su success with our uh, restoration um, but we're lucky that we do have that infrastructure. Um, if we did not have those growing facilities, obviously we wouldn't be able to do this. Um, this is a program where it was a, it was like a trial run. We wanted to see what would happen if we started growing on the park. Um, and it just, it took off um, really, really well. I had to um, increase my growing area size by 60% after the first year. So we just ran out of room. So. Um, that's really wonderful. And then, um, you know, we have a good resource management team too. Um, we have a good working relationship with Pennsylvania DCNR because again, we're working on their property um, and we, we are not affiliated with them at all. So we're, a, we're an outside entity that they allow come on and do this work. Um, and also keep in mind that um, state parks usually do not have um, money set aside for like restoration or research. So that's kind of tough. Um, you know, I, I know birders that do do work on the park and do banding and things like that. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's tough. You know, the state has such a resource here, um, but, you know, they don't always devote money to, I guess, preserving some of that. Um, and then um, I also work with great staff, um, interns, volunteers. We have very enthusiastic uh, people that love what they do and kind of can't, can't wait to get their hands dirty. So that's always nice. Um, and so I do have, just kind of put this up really quickly. Um, uh, we kind of, we do over 5,100 hardwood cut or seeds, um, over 3,000 uh, hardwood cuttings. Um, and we usually do um, almost 2,000 uh, plants every year, but this year it was a little bit lower um, just because it was basically me, um, some of our consortium staff, and then that one volunteer group. So that slowed us down a little bit, um, but we kept going. And uh, I just uh, thank you again to Ducks Unlimited, who we partner with, um, consortium, uh, DCNR, Bob White, and uh, again, all the volunteers that help on the project because uh, they're actually, they, they do the bulk of, of the planting and um, we couldn't do it without them. So uh, any questions? Let I, me get out of my screen sharing thing. I, I had a question, Jen, this is from- yeah. Okay. It sounds like you're in the perfect job for yourself, by the way. I am very, very lucky. I. I would say that to anyone. I just, I'm, I feel so fortunate every day to go to a job I love. Anyway, so I was, I'm so glad to hear you guys are taking on the bittersweet. To, mm -hmm. um, and a lot of the bittersweet is growing in areas where there's high water. Mm -hmm. is, is the high water helping us get rid of any of the invasives? Or not necessarily. 
It actually is. Thanks for asking that. That's a great question. Um, it is helping with some of the invasives and the ones in particular are like Phragmites, for example, um, that actually gets flooded out after a while. Um, so what we're seeing is not only have the removal efforts helped, but the high water levels have also pushed it back. Um, what we're worried about is that when water levels do go down, we feel like there's going to be a resurgence of some of these invasives that have slowed down. Um, and then like conversely, that, um, that flowering rush that I showed you, that pink flower, um, that has sprung up every, in every wet area. And that is something, that's an invasive that thrives in high water levels. So we've kind of We've had good and bad. Um, we've lost a lot of plant diversity um, when it comes to some of the native plants that were growing in our restoration sites. Um, and I think, again, that's due to water levels um, because you know every year those areas are being treated um, and it just, I don't know, it's just, it's, a, it's something that is a, a perpetual um, job, um, especially the monitoring part of it and the removal part. I mean, I'd like to stay employed as long as I can, but um, the growing might get to a point where it's not as necessary, but there's always going to need to be somebody that is checking those areas and making sure that invasives don't start taking over again. But hopefully with the high water levels and the bittersweet, that I'm hoping that will start to um, curtail some of that because it's starting not only to its growth habit goes up trees um, typically but we've seen a lot of it that is just going uh, horizontally over the ground right now and I, I'm not sure exactly why that is um, and we've ha we've had a lot of tree issues on the park this year um, and I think that the high water levels are starting to catch up with some of the tree species that don't like that um, we've had this past weekend, we had a lot of trees. The park was shut down because of the trees that kept falling down. So um, we're getting, it, it's, you know, I guess that park's always in transition is what I'll say. So um, you never see the same thing uh, twice. So <laughs> I've got a question that came up on chat um, from Henry. Okay. Um, he, some, well, no, someone asked, I don't know if it was Henry or not. Is the steeple bush a native spirea? It is. Yep, we have um, steeple bush, and then there's a, hmm, it's a white, looks just like, I think it's called uh, meadow, meadow sweet, maybe? It's oh, a, yeah, it's meadow sweet, spider. yeah. Okay, yep. And uh, the only places that I have seen that right now are in that Thompson Circle area. Um, but if you see it somewhere else, let me know, because it's, it, it's not like, um, I don't know, it's just like one of those things where you wonder how it got there and why there's just a little bit of it. Um, but yeah, I, I grew that from seed. That does a really nice job. So, yeah. Well, this is, um, Sue, I don't have any questions, but boy, that was a wonderful presentation. And for those people who um, came on late, I am recording this session and um, I hope to send out a link to this recording within a day or two, but this was really interesting. I'm so glad that you could pass on all this information and I'm, I'm glad that we will have the Weed Warriors program starting again next year. I am too. Yeah. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate again you hosting me, and um, it's been really fun to to talk to everyone and and kind of see some people. I can see some screens, so that's nice. <laughs> um, but yeah, I just uh, like I said, it's just it's um, it's been a strange year for everyone. Um, but you know, we are still we're still working and trying to plan for the future, and um, we can't wait to get volunteers back out and help us and. Uh, yeah, if you ever see me working out there on the park, stop by and see what I'm doing. Because again, I like to talk about it. It's kind of cool. And um, it, I always can use some bird, um, uh, I, I guess, help, bird identification <laughs> help. So. We um, need to get together. We need to get together. Um, there, there is a question about, um, there is a question about, um, 
uh, Cattails from Chris Lundberg. He has a question. Oh, okay. So, uh, yeah, hi. So first off, I think that area at Thompson Pond, it looks great. I mean, compared to a couple of years ago. And I was, I was, you know, I, I actually, um, I didn't even have some spots there for my marsh bird surveys when I started in 2017. But the last couple of years, I've been doing some survey points there. And I was hoping to get maybe some lease better, but not this year, but next year. Yeah. Um, but the, the cattail, they've been doing a lot of spraying and, and probably some hand removal also of the narrow leaf cattail. Mm -hmm. And so I was wondering, is there any plan for a concerted effort to try and plant common cattail to get that to come up? Um, uh, or is that kind of beyond the scale and scope of what you guys can do? Yeah, actually, um, I, I've grown the native, uh, the latifolia from uh, seed. Um, and I had very good germination results, um, but we're still, we're, we're working with um, Cal U and Penn State. Um, what we're trying to determine is that, you know, both the narrow leaf and, and the native uh, hybridize. Um, and it's, I think it's Penn State's opinion that even though we're seeing stands of native that are popping up in places, um, they might not be the straight native. They might be hybridized with the, um, the narrow leaf. So I, I know that there's kind of a, a constant debate about do we put near, or do we put the native in areas if it's already been hybridized with the, um, the narrow leaf. So I've actually held off on planting that um, until I get kind of a yes, no, because right now we're at a maybe. Um, and I don't want them to have to spray everything out that I grew. So um, that's that's a really good question. That's a that's a, a challenge question for us because um, we're just not exactly sure um, what we're looking at when we think we are seeing the native. It that all the attributes look like the native species, but um, they they would have to like they started to do some genetic testing. Um, and they would have to resume that to actually like give us an idea of what um, what we're actually looking at. So that's a that's a tricky that's a tricky thing. So thank you. Yeah, you're there's, welcome. There's another question about uh, to, to ask you to talk about the native plant sales. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I I do have a native plant sale, um, and this year it was a virtual sale. So you purchase things online and then there was a pickup day. Um, and I, I believe, and I, I'm hope not speaking out of turn, but um, I, I think we're going to do virtual for next year as well, because we just, we're not sure, nobody's sure what's going to happen. And we had such a great um, kind of, I guess, um, response from, um, from the virtual sale. I think people seem to enjoy that. Uh, so my plant sale is um, always the first, the pickup day is always the first Saturday in June. So um, we probably would post um, the things for sale in maybe like mid-April to throughout May. Um, and that would be a, um, if you follow Go Native Erie, um, Weed Warriors or the Regional Science Consortium online, um, we'll be posting on that, like when our website opens up. Um, but I'm going to try to get everything up as early as I can. Um, I just, I have my inventory actually ready for next year, but I have to see what comes back um, after this winter. So I can't sell it, it's not alive. So um, so that's, um, that's always going to occur, whether it's in person or virtually. But thank you for asking about that. That actually... Um, <coughs> that does is it um, it pays for a lot of our education and improvements in the plant lab. So it buys a lot of materials for students that come in, um, which is something that we kind of are lacking in, right? Especially because everybody has to have their own thing once we actually can work with students again. One thing I did want to mention real quick, I brought, I brought this home from my lab too on purpose, is um, there's a book about native plants that I really like, and it talks a lot about birds in it, um, because one of the premises of this um, is that uh, if you plant native plants, 
Um, you can create your own backyard ecosystem. And if you plant the right things, like for example, planting host plants for a lot of butterflies, you actually do a great service to young birds um, because baby birds, I didn't really pay attention to this, but baby birds, I guess, don't eat seeds. They eat a lot of like caterpillars and things like that and other insects. So um, this actually, this book, Bringing Nature Home by Doug Tallamy. Um, oops, here, just, library has this, but it's, I got this online. Um, it, you might see it backwards, sorry. No, <laughs> um, it's perfect. Okay, great. Um, I really like this as a resource. It has a lot of nice lists and it does talk about the relationship that like, for example, birds and native plants have. Um, Cause you know, I, I look at native plants as like the bottom of the food chain for everything. Um, and I know that a lot of people are interested in uh, supporting um, different species of birds throughout their migration or if they're resident birds um, and also, you know, kind of doing it in a natural way. Um, and, and this is a great, this is a great resource. Um, so I thought you guys in particular would like that. So, um, but we, we have more questions. Oh, good. <laughs> um, okay. First of all, John Vanco wants to know, do you share some of these plant seeds or cuttings with other um, thinking horticultural gardens, arboreta, et cetera? Um, I actually, um, I have a separate set of things that I, um, plant material that I work off of for my Go Native Erie um, program. And uh, that is something that I do donate uh, to like great public green spaces and schools and things like that. So the answer is yes. A short, short answer is yes. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm kind of wondering, <clears throat> uh, are, you know, there are some very rare plant species at the, uh, at the peninsula Mm -hmm. And uh, is there an effort to preserve them, or there are there other ecosystems uh, where they might be appropriate? Um, you know, there there are a f there are a few. Um, a lot of our uh, rare, threatened, or endangered plants on the park are um, they're they're like dune plants because we don't you know obviously in Pennsylvania that's the only um, like beach or dune type setting. Um, but there are many others. And um, right now I do grow some of them for restoration. Um, I have worked on projects um, to repopulate on the park. Um, and there's usually we work with other uh, partners um, to try to do that like where appropriate. Like for example, um, there's a group that wants to uh, repopulate the wild lup lupine that was at uh, Erie Bluffs. So I have seeds set aside for that project. So if there's something that you're thinking about, let shoot me an email um, and let me know because that that might be something that you know we could work together on on a project. Um, definitely, yeah. Well, well, I got you. The uh, what, what what woody woody plants are you uh, propagating and planting besides um, the dogwood? <laughs> okay, so I do um, the red osier and then a silky dogwood. Um, I do buttonbush, elderberry, sandbar willow, sometimes high bush blueberry, but I don't like the way that comes out. Um, I've done winterberry. That can be a little tricky. I'm trying to think of what else. Nine bark. I don't know. I think that might be it, but I don't have my list in front of me. <laughs> so. Yeah, and these these are these are all ones that that you're propagating there. So they they may be varieties that are a good deal different from what's in general circulation. Yes. Yeah, they're, they're going to be the, the straight natives. They're not going to be cultivars. Um, and oftentimes when you buy at a greenhouse and nursery, you're, you're getting a cultivar. And that's not always bad because sometimes the cultivars are bred to, like, say, for example, produce more fruit or be more resistant to disease. So that, but if you want the straight native, it can be a little bit challenging to find that. Um, and, and actually in my yard, I have kind of a mix of both. It, it, like I said, it is difficult um, to find, you know, the, the native that 
is not a cultivar. Um, so yeah, that's, you know, what I'm taking is right from the park. And I, I do have, just so people know, I do have collection permits for that. Um, you're not supposed to come down and just take things from the park. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, because I, I know it's kind of weird because I don't drive a marked vehicle and I don't wear a uniform. So <laughs> oftentimes people will see me just gathering seeds and they probably wonder what I'm doing. And I'm sure the rangers get called every so often um, when I'm out there. <laughs> but, yeah. Right, uh, a question from Chris Lundberg. Do okay. you and do you do any planting or have plans to do planting of pickerel weed? Um, I have never grown pickerel weed. Um, and and actually that's that's funny because I, I uh, almost collected it, I actually slapped it out of my hand. Um, I, I try to work just in the emergent zone. Um, so I don't usually do like the floating plant. I, I know that can be, emer that's emergent for, for the most part, but I don't, I don't do a lot of uh, things that are like out in deeper water and I don't do any of the aquatics, um, like the submerged aquatics uh, right now. Um, we're kind of looking at that, but that, that involves like a, a different facility than what we have right now. Um, but so, yeah, I, I haven't done pickerel weed. Have you grown it before? Uh, no, I, I just have not. It. it's one of my favorite uh, wetland plants out I there. I like it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, and we do have some healthy populations of it, but, um, you know, bees really seem to like it. So that's definitely something that, you know, could be put on the table for, you know, previous um, phases, because again, we, we will be, you know, moving away from the three sites eventually and going into maybe like the lagoon system and uh, like long pond and things like that, where um, that might be great. But I'm only 5'3", so I have to be able to get get out to these areas. So. <laughs> um, I, I, I personally have a question. Okay. Um, do, do, does your work um in any way extend to gold point um hmm. primarily because you know that's my life my my life <laughs> so i'm curious if there's any uh, any uh plans for out there i think gold point was a little bit more accessible than yes um i know that Third accessible <laughs> <laughs> And I actually, I was just out there um, recently to, to do a special plant scouting mission, but, um, you know, it, it's something that we would uh, like to explore more. Um, I, there's got to be a way to do it, even if it means like pontoon boats and like, you know, kind of driving things over, um, over the water to get into the the um, more remote areas, there's got to be a way to get in there. And I, I think that there's a lot of untapped potential there. So it's kind of exciting to, to think about. I don't know. Well, I, I, I'm, you know, you said you were going to talk about or you're looking at more remote locations. And I was just curious if that was one of them or what other remote locations do you have in mind? Yeah, that's the remotest of the remote locations, I think. Um, we're looking a, a little bit around, um, you know, like the, the interior lagoon system, um, which would only be accessible, I think, by like pontoon boat if we brought people out. Um, and then, like I said, like um, dead pond, long pond area. Um, kind of looking at the wildlife that's look uh, that's inhabiting some of those areas and seeing if we can increase their populations, um, especially some of the rare, rare guys that live out on our park. So um, I also, I really like the, um, the savanna that's out there with, um, you know, and, and I've actually done a collection of dune plants. So we- uh, On Long Pond. Um, yep. Yeah. yeah. And, and so I'm hoping that we may um, get some funding to do some restoration in that area. But, you know, again, work on grants. So 
can't right. start to work until we get that. But, right. um, but yeah, so there's a, like I said, there's a lot of untapped potential. There's a lot of areas that I personally would like to get into. Um, it's just uh, not enough time. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, that that was all my questions. Um, I, I'm, yeah, I'm incredibly curious about everything here. Um, but um, it, it is the cottonwood um, shallow rooted. I, you know, I think it, it kind of. I'm not sure about the root system as much as I know that they're not a real long lived tree. Right. And so I think that we might be getting like, some of the trees I think are at the end of, of their life cycle. Um, and then there's all kinds of ways to like stress out a tree, you know, whether it's disease or like high water, low water, what, I mean, you name it, whatever, even like soil compaction and things like that. So we, you know, we get a lot of down trees and I don't, I, I think it's probably a lot of different factors, um, but it seems like this year more than ever, we've had like a, a lot come down. Um, so I don't know if that's just me noticing it more or if it's, if there's something going on. I mean, you have to also realize that there were restoration area uh, or uh, restoration work that was done a hundred years ago on the park or well, actually longer um, than that where they did go in and mass plant trees. So we might be seeing die-offs from things that were all planted at the same time. Um, but that's a that's a Brian Gula question because he has a lot of that information um, about the history of the park and the work that was done, which is I'm trying to encourage him to put everything together because that would be kind of cool to see. Okay, I've got a hard question. Okay. Um, in, in the past um, 10 years that I've been working out there, more or less, um, I've seen, you know, where um, mitigation has occurred for Phragmite and various other things, um, primarily along the, the lake shore um, between Beach Ten and Gull Point. Okay. And, um, and, and I'm grateful that the Phragmite has been has been um, at least partially under control. I'm seeing a lot more erosion mm -hmm. because of that work. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm curious as to the um, relationship between the, the removal of invasives and mm -hmm the increase in erosion? Yeah, and that's that's a great question. Um, Cause like anytime you do remove something that has a root system that's, you know, keeping um, soil, you know, in, in its place or sediment, you know, kind of locked in somewhere, um, you know, you are gonna have that. And that that's actually, that's a, that's a question that I think, well, I'm not a geologist, so I have a hard time um, answering it, but I think that that's something that we, that should be brought up um, to our park resource manager. And um, I know that uh, they, the park is aware of some of the erosion that is occurring. And um, I don't, have information as far as are, are they doing something about it or planning to do something about it I'm not sure um, but that that is something that I think should be brought up especially around around the Gulf Point area um, that's a place where you know even the park staff don't get out very often um, and it's become yeah. You know, I, I mean, you know that. Um, yeah. you know, <laughs> Very much so. It's starting to be like more and more inaccessible. So I think that um, that might be something that it would be good to be, you know, brought to the attention of management so that they're at least aware of what's happening because we may look at perhaps doing like more restoration um, there because we certainly don't want to um, you know, do anything detrimental to that area, um, 
with our restoration efforts, you know, I mean, if, if we're removing some material, then maybe we should look at putting something back um, in its place, because um, that's kind of what we're doing right now with other areas. But um, that's, you know, something that I, I would definitely find concerning. Um, and, you know, again, you know, we can, we can talk privately about like who, who to contact, but you might know. Our Absolutely. Um, yes. And so, someone mentioned, um, could the erosion also be due to the high water levels and no ice in warm winters? And, and yes, that, that, that's absolutely a possibility. But I, I have watched, um, for example, the, um, there's an area just east of Beach 10 okay. um, that is, that at at one point the trail was um, was interior, and I'm sorry for my meowing cats. They're hungry, um, and um, they um, it, and that area was solid because there was a stand of fram fragmite there, and and I didn't particularly like the fragmite there. But the Phragmite was removed and, and it has, it's gone now. Well, now that area is a beach and it changes regularly with the incoming, you know, okay. weather and, and, and erosion. And I'm just, you know, I, I'm just curious. Um, and I, I've also seen a similar situation with um, areas where, um, invasive um, honeysuckle mm -hmm. have been removed where there used to be a lot of understory birds and now they're not because the honeysuckle was removed. Mm -hmm. And I know the honeysuckle is invasive, but I'm also like, like, or are the, the, are the birds getting you know, or removing or moving to a different area because what used to be an understory is no longer an understory. Yeah, and and that's um that's a good point too. Um, the honeysuckle, which I, I know I didn't mention um, before, that um, we kind of I feel like we're chasing our tail on that. Um, the the park um, realizes that our Pretty much like 90% of the understory on the park is, is honeysuckle, it seems like, um, yeah. maybe more in other er in certain areas. But um, what, um, you know, what I was told is that they would remove areas where it wasn't particularly vis um, visible to visitors and that birds also needed an understory. So until they had a plan or funding or something, um, to kind of maybe um, do a removal and then a planting, um, they were gonna they were gonna just like kind of spot target treat that, um, and of course that could change their management plans change um, yearly. So I'm not sure what you know the current plan the current plan will come out I think in January or February, um, but um, you know that that's a tough one because when you remove something like that. I feel like you have to be ready to go in and put something else in, um, just like the the head of the peninsula with those trees. Um, you know, I've been trying to put an understory in there, um, and then we got hit with high water, so um, that kind of kept me out of that area for a little bit. But um, you know, it's it, I I think we have to come full circle with some of our management plans. And again, it's like there, you know, the DCNR is is doing the removals of the invasives. Um, and and it, they cover a lot more acreage than we can do with restoration right now. So um, it's all if you see areas like that, you know, again, bringing it to park staff attention is probably good because that um, that may um, dictate how things are either managed or um, you know if there's funding that's available. That might be something that they'll consider. Um, because again, you know, certainly we're trying to help wildlife. We don't want to negatively impact it. Um, or the same, same go, goes with erosion. I mean, some of it is the high water levels, definitely. Um, but again, I do feel like you need something 
Um, in some of the areas, uh, you do need some kind of plantings to secure that um, sediment, you know, because it just, it washes away. And um, so I think we've kind of all seen that. First okay. Yeah, Mary, good comments, definitely, yeah. Can, can, I, can I say something related to that? Sure. When, oh. we built the, when we built the feather, mm -hmm. that, that was a wetland. We actually worked in water when we built it. Okay, yeah. But within a few years, I don't know, probably more than more than a few, but it, with, <laughs> it wasn't, it wasn't, I don't know, I lost all perspective, but uh, the, the water went away. And I remember talking to Harry Leslie about it and Harry said, well, it's because of the Phragmites. Mm -hmm. uh, and the Phragmites uh, have turned it from a wet, uh, a wet wetland <laughs> into a dry wetland. Yep. And and then uh, just uh, within this year in the science uh, uh, news uh, have been articles about the Phragmites and uh, building soil and they're looking at, you know, sea level rise mm -hmm. and that they, it is a very effective means of protecting the beaches. So the, the erosion that Mary witnesses uh, could very well have resulted from the removal of the Phragmites, which tends to have that power to hold, hold soil together and actually raise level, uh, uh, raise the, the soil level or reduce the water level. Yeah. 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 And again, the high water that we're experiencing too right now is um, it, it, the, it, the cycle is. Um, I feel like we're we're still due for another year or so um, of high water levels, but it's cyclical, and so we will have like a lower um, periods, hopefully, and then um, you know we can make some more headway with the restoration. But you know, I, I understand what you're saying too. Like we need like something that is rhizomous, like a, like Phragmites, is mm -hmm. something that is going to um, you know have that holding power. So. Um, you know, I, I guess I, I would like to see something put in, um, but, um, but definitely, um, you know, it, it does have its, its place. Um, I just, I'm not sure, um, like a, an area. I don't think like it's, Presque Presque I don't think it's Presque Isle, it's not its place, but it should be one place that's <laughs> free of it. It's got plenty of places, yeah. <laughs> but I'm just saying yeah, that, that, that there is there is there is real um, movement on on the on the seaboard on on the Atlantic seaboard toward yeah. accepting Phragmites and benefiting from it. Uh, but that, that, shouldn't be the, that shouldn't be the case with us. <laughs> Right, and it, it is tough too because we do have a lot of homeowners that ask that that are lakefront homeowners, and they say, "Well, should I take it out?" And you know, my first thought with that is, "Okay, but what are you going to put? What's your plan? What are you going to put right back in there?" Because you can't remove something that's like stabilizing a bank right now, um, and not have something vegetative on that area. Um, you know, really quickly. Um, so, I mean, that, that, that is a, I think that's a geologist question too. Like, I think that there, I think there's some technical, um, you know, folks that, that could be brought in that would help us with that. Cause I, I do see areas that are, um, that are, are damaged by erosion, but that is, again, like John said that it's like, a, you know, catch 22, like some of the bad plants were, we're doing a good job at certain things, like uh, the honeysuckle being an understory for birds, um, like perching birds. It it is uh, it's it's really tough um, to kind of weigh the pros and cons sometimes of removal. Yeah, um, it, well, it's like it's like the uh, multiflora rose, you know. Right. <laughs> it's become ubiquitous because of the birds, because right. actually. It, it does find favor with native species they, yeah. and the birds like it and they spread it all over. They sure do. <laughs> yep. Yeah, but no, those are, those are great points. I'm glad actually that you brought that up because it's, um, you know, I think it'll, it'll change the way that people think about the park when they drive on there next, you know, when they start going around and looking at the things, um, I think they'll realize that the, the, 
it's not it's not as black and white sometimes uh, you know there's a lot of gray area with the work that's done and trying to make the right choices and and um you know working with the resources that we have but um again like we i i love hearing you know people's suggestions if they've read something um you know if you have research and you forward it on to me i think that's great because um you know my learning never stops um and and certainly um you know if there's something that we can pull out and do better um for the park you know i certainly want to do that so yeah please keep Keep, you know, keep in contact, keep in touch and, and let me know what you're hearing because, or, or what you're, you know, what things you've experienced personally, because I feel like a lot of you have been on the park for many, many years and uh, have seen a lot of changes. So if there's, if there's um, positives or negatives, you know, please let, let somebody know so that, um, you know, it, it's like another set of eyes out there is good for us. So I never get out of the wetlands. <laughs> so, okay, yeah. we have more questions. Okay. Believe it or not. <laughs> um, well, Chris Lundberg says, when, it, when it, I was talking about Phragmite and erosion, um, he said, I have exactly the same concern about the removal of the narrow leaf cattails and the habitat for least bitterns. And, and I would... Um, I would, I would second his question about that. And then someone asked what would be a suitable native replacement for honeysuckle. And there have been some suggestions, um, but I, we, I think it would be great to hear from you because you might know what is appropriate for the park or not. And, um, and John, okay, all right. <laughs> Okay. Never mind. So th that was a huge question with, with <laughs> lots of facets. Um, but um, I, 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 I'm curious mostly about uh, Chris's question with the narrow leaf cocktail um, and, and the, the removal of appropriate um, nesting habitat for least bitterns. Well, I, I don't know really anything about least bitterns, but um, Chris can help you with that. <laughs> and this is this is kind of just anecdotal evidence. Um, when I'm in Leo's, they seem like they shoot out of areas that have a lot of river bulrush and um, uh, greater burr reed. So I don't know if those are two na uh, two natives that are. Um, maybe acceptable replacements for them. Um, they do have similar growth habits. So I don't know if that's something that they would like, but I, I know that at, Le at Leo's, there are small pockets of narrow leaf cattail, but I'm seeing a lot more of the um, burr reed and the river bulrush out there. So I was wondering, or even like maybe the um, soft stem bulrush, um, so that, that's pretty tall uh, as well. So I guess those would be like three of my potential suggestions, not really knowing what the least bittern is looking for. <laughs> so <laughs> um, I don't know, Chris, does that make sense to you? I mean, are they, I don't know what the least bittern wants. <laughs> well, uh, I've been trying to figure that out too. Okay. They do need areas that are relatively dense that they okay. can forage in and, and have some protection for, from predators. Okay. Um, I mean, I, I've seen them in Phragmites, mm -hmm. but definitely I've had the impression that, that once a Phragmites area gets really all-encompassing and large, and really dense that then they're not in there. But oh. just you know, isolated bits of Phragmates that they, they, you know, I, I've seen them foraging in there. Um, but the, the narrow leaf cattails, there were a lot of areas along say um, Long Pond where they removed huge areas. And now there's really large areas of open water or uh, replaced with um, uh, uh, um, Oh, what's the flat leaf stuff, the emergent stuff that has the leaves on the, my brain's fuzzy right now. Uh, anyway. Um, um, is it like the uh, new far, the uh, spatter dock 
Yeah, or, that's what I'm thinking of. Okay. And so, so there were areas where I'd had the 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 least bitterns for several summers that were just were were gone there the last couple of years because mainly some it's hard it's part of the problem with the study that I've been doing is it's been really hard to draw any kind of conclusions because of the confounding variable of the really high waters that we've had. Um, but but there's there's particular areas of Long Pond that I'm thinking about where I didn't have them because there just wasn't that tall emergent vegetation pockets of it that they could kind of, of hide out in. Um, uh, 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 and so I, I, I'm not going to claim I know the answer, but that, that's, that's why I was specific about asking, you know, my, my thoughts were, well, okay, you know, if the, if the narrow leaf is invasive, uh, and if the, if the, if the common cat tail the latifolia is, is, if there's papers on it, that's maybe it's better habitat, that's fine, but just spraying and removing the narrow leaf cat tail without having a program for replacing it with the latifolia, just, I, I was just, I, that's why I asked that earlier question. I was just kind of wondering how that was all going to work. <laughs> that's a good question. Actually, I wrote down, because like I said, we were, we were looking at Long Pond for a potential restoration area. And I know that they pay attention to Lee Spittern um, because we actually have to wait to spray in areas until the bittern is um, finished nesting or, or maybe the, the young have fledged. I'm not exactly sure what, how they're determining when that occurs. Yeah, basically when the, when the young are fledged. Okay. It created a lot of problems for um, <laughs> the park back in 2017. Yeah, they okay. had me do a parallel thing. They were trying to have they, they would ask me, they would say, we want to spray an area. And they, they were wanting to do this in like June and July. And they say, okay, we want to spray an area. And they let me know. And the next day I could get out there, I would I would go out and look for veterans. But I was finding so many, so many places that they finally just threw up their hands. And so in the last couple of years, it's been, we're just going to wait until uh, basically about mid-August. And then, you know, we're based on the, the data of when the, the birds nest and the birds fledge, they, they will be pretty much gone then. Um, and so that that was my doing. Ah, oh, so that was you going. Yeah. <laughs> no, that actually doesn't, it doesn't really affect my work because I can get in the plant. Um, but yeah, I've heard, um, but you know, about the waiting till the, the leaf bittern um, is, is less susceptible to the, um, to the treatments, um, but no, that's that's good to know as far as what um, what the bittern is looking for um, because because um, that can potentially you know if we do select long pond um, that'll help dictate what um, you know maybe what goes there um, because again I'm I, I'm looking at what is there I'm trying to keep you know, things that I find um, in the same area um, and try to increase the diversity. Um, if we see populations that are starting to like uh, diminish because invasives were at an area, um, but just knowing that um, things like the bitter need something that is a little taller and denser, um, you know, that definitely can help. I, you know, cause that can be then a priority that, um, we try to grow, um, you know, like I said, I, it, the river bulrush and greater burrito are the two things that come to mind. Um, I guess I'll, I'll have to look at my, my lists too and see if there's anything else that seems to fit that bill. But, um, but yeah, that's, that's definitely helpful. I mean, I, like I said, I, I, I'm not a birder. I don't know birds. So um, if you're noticing that populations are moving away, um, that's good for us to know too, because again, you know, we don't, we want to benefit the wildlife that's there. We don't want to have a negative impact. And, you know, obviously the removal is going to, um, because that will take habitat away, but if we can then go in and replace it, potentially that would be um, better, a better job than, you know, kind of what, what we're doing right now. So yeah, good. I'm, I'm totally psyched that we've had this connection. 
Okay. Um, because we're, we're, I feel like we're, we're actually solving problems that like maybe we didn't know we had. Um, there is one more question out there, like, like, um, in terms of understory, like what would replace the invasive honeysuckle and, and should, should the park pursue planting of a native understory or should we just let you know nature take its course shall we say um i i think that we need to have a really solid plan before we go in and do anything um i think that you guys like have have brought up um you know there there's always a, a disconnect between groups um, if you noticed on the park, there's not always good communication. Um, and so I'm really happy that we've had this conversation too, because I think it's, it gives me a little bit of direction uh, too, because I mean, I, I can choose, like I said, we focus on pollinators, but I can also choose bird friendly plants to, um, you know, to, to uh, populate areas with um, understory, I definitely am loving um, everything dogwood because it just, it's so easy to grow. Um, I don't know that I would replace right away because I, I feel like um, between the, the bittersweet and the honeysuckle that are on our more upland areas, um, the seed bank is probably loaded with invasive seeds. So, um, and there probably would be some natives in the mix. Um, that actually might be an area where um, like a, a multi-year seed bank study would be appropriate. Um, and that's actually something that we've also been taught. We just need funding <laughs> for these projects, but, um, but honestly, um, you know how, how prolific honeysuckle and bittersweet are um, they seem to grow hand in hand, like in the medians and things like that, and in certain areas. Um, I think that area, it it is just it's just crying out for restoration, but it has to be done in the right way, um, and it it's going to be with research first. Check, you know, just like I said, checking the seed bank, seeing what's what's germinating there, um, having a very solid management plan for it. Um, because that's a lot of ground to cover, literally. Um, you know, the, the wetland uh, project, um, I'm not, I can't remember the total number of acres that we put in, um, but when you include the upland areas on the park, that's just, that's a lot, a lot more um, staffing and a, a lot more funding for it, but um, maybe a test site for something like that would be kind of cool just to, just to kind of see what what a site would look like um, in year two and year three and year four, because that's that's I think the unknown for us. We haven't tried anything like that before, and and I think before they start taking stuff out, um, we need to figure out what's going to come back in it. And even if we do plant, that doesn't mean that invasives aren't going to come back in that area. So um, that's a I don't know. That's I guess that's job security for resource management folks. So, um, but yeah, I don't know. That's a, that's a, that's a good, that's a, that's a very profound. Now I'll be thinking about that the rest of the night. So, yeah. Hmm. Any, any more questions? Cause I, I kind of, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I, I don't see any more questions in okay. chat. Yeah. I don't have any more questions. Uh, myself, Susan, you want to take over? Uh, sure. Uh, as long as we don't, well, wait a minute. There's a couple more things coming up here in chat. Uh, okay. What is the contact method for the project? That would be, um, it looks like getting rid of some of the underlying invasives and replace or maybe getting rid of them and seeing what comes back. I think that's what the person is asking. Okay, so is it like my, oops, sorry, I just almost knocked my desk over. Um, like my contact info or, um, because I, I, I guess we would um, either contacting, it, probably me because um, 
what we would do is start looking for funding for that project. Um, and I don't think I shared my email. Um, so I can, let me just write it down. Because it's a long one. <laughs> Thank the consortium director for this. Okay, so not sure. Okay, so it's there's Jen at Reg Sci Consort. So that stands for Regional Science Consortium. Dot com. <laughs> so. <laughs> and you are recording this. I, if I could see a chat box, which I cannot right now, I would, um, I would definitely type that in myself uh, for you all. I'm well, sorry. I'm trying. I, I'm actually trying to do that now. Reg, Jen at Reg, by SCI Consort C O N S O R T dot com. Uh, uh, R E G I S. No, R E G S. Oh, rage. <laughs> well, it looks like Chris put it in the chat box. Oh, cool. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, and yeah. I there we go. I, I kind of feel like we need to. Thank you, Chris. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. I feel like we need to um, continue this. At, uh, conversation at another time because there's a, a lot um, of idea sharing that I think would be really beneficial. Um, so no, uh, I, this yeah. has been fabulous yeah. for me. Um, I, I've learned so very much um, and I have very hungry cats that <laughs> need to be fed. Um, but um, in, in, in retrospect, I think this is the that we've made a lot of great connections tonight and I, I just think this is fabulous. Yeah, and, and I guess it's always nice, um, you know, when different groups learn about the work that they're doing on the park because I think we have similar goals. Um, but unfortunately, like I said, the, the communication isn't always out there or we don't know who to reach out to um, for information. Um, and so I would love to do like another Zoom meeting just to talk about stuff. Um, I, I don't know, things that, you know, things that you've noticed, um, things that I can take to the, the resource management meeting, um, you know, things that um, probably should be brought up to the, the park management, um, just, you know, just things that they may not be aware of. Because again, it's, it's a big park and everyone's doing something different and um, I've noticed that patient doesn't always make it to the to the right um, right person. So um, the more that we can kind of share ideas and talk about it, I think the better um, you know ev everybody's outcomes will be. Um, because again, I, I feel like we're so isolated in our own groups often um, that you know you you don't. I guess you just only have your little bit of the story. So um, yeah, definitely, you know, some other, some other dialogue between us would be awesome. Um, and I'd definitely be up for it. Um, maybe not on a Friday night though, because it's, it's way past wine time for me. <laughs> 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 Closer to bedtime. That, that's been my problem for the past 15 years. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm drinking water right now, so it's just not the same. <laughs> okay, just go drink wine now. Just go drink wine. <laughs> Anybody have any more questions? Okay, you're done. Okay, well then, I, it was a pleasure talking to everyone, and uh, I look forward to, to seeing you um, again. So, all right. Hey, thanks, thanks Jen. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thanks, Jen. All right. You're welcome.